Which one's your son? This one in the front. Oh, hi. I've got a copy of my magazine for you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's that? Can, can I um, welcome you to um, this, the uh, third in our series looking at um, populism and science. Um, and for those of you, it's the first time you're here, just to remind you that um, we're in the Oxford Martin School, uh, which was founded by the benefactor James Martin, uh, who had this image uh, around problems of the 21st century and how we could combine science and research and academia and education uh, to tackle them. And so there are some 35 research institutes that work here uh, in all subjects, um, all the way from the hard sciences right the way across to ethics and philosophy uh, and the arts. The other um, important reason why we're here from my perspective is this is also to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the founding of the Institute of Population Aging, which was founded in 1998. Uh, and some people say, okay, population aging, why are you doing something on populism and science? And I think that's because one of the things as uh, academics and we are uh, demographers and economists and sociologists and people who work in social policy, and we work a lot with our colleagues in medicine and biology in particular, and one of the things we're very aware of is that in our world, the huge changes that are occurring around things like reproductive medicine and longevity, uh, and many of you may have heard the Prime Minister's speech uh, on Monday where she talked about transforming social care for us all, but particularly for those with chronic diseases by using AI, artificial intelligence, and what does that mean for the public, and is the public really aware uh, of those kind of debates? So that's why we, uh, people who work in demography are very, very interested uh, in the world of the interaction between science and communication. And those of you who have been here for this series, um, if you remember, we started um, with Andreas Sidomuka, who came from the Cabinet Office and was talking about Policy Lab and the shift in the government from looking at the provider of policy to the consumer of policy and the role of trying to engage in different ways with the public so that the public understood why policy was being made. And then last week we had um, Fiona Fox uh, from the Science Media Center talking about the role of the journalist uh, and how journalists um, could help inform uh, around scientific debates. And I just want to um, say, uh, quote you one thing that Fiona said, because lots of people afterwards discussed this. Um, she said the role of the journalist is to report what is said accurately. It's not necessarily the role of the journalist to find the truth. Now that's a view of the head of the Science Media Center. And so one has to ask that if it isn't the role of the journalist to give the truth, then who is it who should be helping us all understand those huge complexities around science? And I think one of the things that we as academics uh, very much have come to realize is that people sort of get science, they get David Attenborough, they get Brian Cox, but they don't necessarily understand the process. And so this week, I'm delighted that we have two experts from uh, the area of real science communication uh, who are going to uh, introduce themselves, talk a little bit about uh, the area they work in, and then we will have a general discussion, hopefully with most people in the room being involved, because this is meant to be a panel and a debate, uh, to try and tease out what is the role of those people who work in science communication. And so we are delighted to have Catherine Matheson, who's with us. She's the chief executive of the British Science Association, um, but has also worked extraordinarily in natural sciences, in the forensic science um, service, um, around and in pharmaceuticals, and in the, the um, science line. But he's going to talk predominantly about your experience with the British Science Association. And Emily Wilson, uh, who is the new editor uh, of the New Scientist, but previously was a journalist at The Guardian, the assist, one of the assistant editors at The Guardian. So um, welcome to you both. Um, and we're going to start with Catherine, just to introduce by talking for a few minutes about the British Science Association. Thank you for the introduction, Sarah. It's delightful to be here and see so many people, and I'm looking forward to the discussion bit, especially. So Emily and I have pre-arranged that we're going to keep this bit fairly short and informal just to get the conversation going, uh, and then get into a bit of Q&A and debate. Um, 
So, as Sarah said, I'm Chief Executive of an organisation called the British Science Association, which is an independent charity that is really interested in the relationship between science and the rest of society. And we were founded in 1831, uh, so a little while ago now, by a bunch of what were then called natural philosophers, uh, who were very concerned that the discussions going on about science in groups like the Royal Society were cut off from the rest of the public. And they wanted a forum to discuss the emerging findings of natural philosophers with a public audience. And we stay true to that kind of vision and that spirit today. What we tend to talk about today, though, is we talk about wanting science to be seen as a more fundamental part of culture. So, and I'm going to argue, I think, that by talking about public understanding of science or focusing on understanding or lack of it is taking us down the wrong route to solving the problem we're trying to solve. I think we should be thinking about science as a cultural endeavour, a very human endeavour, and thinking about how people can see science as part of their own culture and their own everyday lives, and what that relationship with science then enables them to build in terms of a longer, lifelong relationship with science, scientific controversy, um, the kind of topics that Sarah was talking about. Um, and we, when we think about the work that we do, so we do a huge range of public programmes, we do a lot of work with schools and in education, and, uh, we work with policymakers in the media and researchers directly as well. When we think about the public audiences we're working with, we divide them into four different groups. So one group is the group we call the professionals. So around 9% of the population, people who have a job in science. And by the way, when I'm talking about these groups, they're not my definitions. They're not the British Science Association's definitions. They're the definitions of the people answering the survey. So whatever they think science is, we say to them, do you work in a science job? And if they say yes, whatever that job is, whatever kind of science it is, we put them in that group of professionals. And if you have a job in science, if your identity is as a science professional, then that gives you a kind of standing or a status. If you go into a science space, you feel a sense of confidence, a sense of, you know, that your knowledge is respected. Um, almost regardless of what level that knowledge is, it's a professional identity that you hold with regard to science. Then there's a bunch of people who don't necessarily have a science job, but when we ask them in a survey, they say, I'm really interested in science. I make an active effort to seek out science news, science events, science activities. For those people, science is part of their identity too. But it's not really a professional identity, it's more of an everyday identity. They read popular science books, they watch science on the TV, you know, they etc, etc. They read new science, they subscribe to New Scientist magazine, they go to events. Uh, and that activity, that conversation between people with a kind of everyday science identity, who we would call engaged, and people with a professional science identity, that, that the level of dialogue and discussion and debate is really important. But through our surveys, it's only taking place between a quarter of the UK's population. The other three quarters of the population are not in that conversation. The other three quarters of the population uh, fall into two groups. Half the population has an inactive science identity. They say on a survey, oh yeah, I'm kind of interested in science, but I don't make a special effort to seek it out. So they're going about their everyday life. Science isn't particularly relevant. But if they see something interesting or surprising or scary, then they will read the article or, uh, or you know, tweet the link or whatever it is. Uh, but for the most part, they're not really seeking it out. And then for a quarter of the population, they say, science is not for me. So for these people, they're making an effort to kind of stay away from anything that's labeled science. And bear in mind that although my definition of science is very broad, it includes economics, social science, maths, computing, et cetera, uh, for the purposes of this conversation though, or this survey, I'm relying on what the people answering the survey think science is. And often for the people who say I'm not interested, it's whatever they did at school. It's the biology, chemistry, physics at school. And they tell me things like, my chemistry teacher hated me, you know, and I just couldn't pass my maths exam and all this kind of stuff. And I, the reason I think that's a problem is because when it comes to the kind of cutting edge technologies or the big societal decisions we're going to have to make about aging, autonomous vehicles, AI, etc., we need everyone to be involved in the conversation. Otherwise, we're making a decision that only a quarter of the population is involved with. And that decision is not going to fly long term. We're going to see a backlash like we did with GM. I'm going to stop there and let Emily come in. Um, I um, did a degree in uh, chemistry 
in the sort of early 1300s, and then I spent um, uh, uh, years and years and years. I did, I've done everything. I was a sort of tabloid reporter. I was a medical reporter for the Mail, which was a, a great challenge between you know between you know what you're asked to do and what you did do. And um, and then I spent 18 years at the Guardian, and I ran their Australian bureau. Did all kinds of things, but I kept coming back. To science now and again, I launched a science section for a guy called Life, which died. And I, at different times, I'd sort of hire science and environment teams. Most recently, I ran their science and environment and health, and all their philanthropically funded teams would look at stuff like you know health problems in the global south. And I've been at New Scientist, not the, they dropped that apparently at some point, um, in uh, for six weeks at New Scientist, at New Scientist, um, and. Uh, I don't have any evidence to back that up. That's what we were disagreeing about out there. But I think, but there's no blind trial we can do, but I think that being not engaged with science, science doesn't mean that people aren't sort of surrounded in the thick stream of science. I think if you read the Daily Mail now, you get quite good health advice, and that's all based on huge scientific trials. If you watch The Martian in the movies, you know, people can argue about, did he need to mix poo with the soil to grow potatoes on Mars? But there's loads of science in things like that. In Westworld and Silicon Valley, they, all these massive themes of AI are explored. So just because people say, oh, I don't like science, doesn't mean that they're not a lot more scientifically literate than their parents and their grandparents were. And I would say, I based, there's no trial, but I would say we're becoming as a society much more literate even if people wouldn't identify as scientifically literate. We, we, we had a very um, sort of early start of a quite controversial discussion about this. Um, and I, I, mean, I, think, I think that's very interesting because I think, Catherine, your view is actually quite the opposite. Um, what, so why, why do you think that you, as a journalist, um, have, this, have the idea that you have, that, that, that actually people get the process of science, they really understand process, we, we, I mean, we, we've had all sorts of issues where, yeah. to be perfectly honest, there was huge confusion out there. Um, and maybe it was the scientists didn't express it properly, or maybe the journalists didn't express it properly. But you only have to look at MMR, you only have to look at GM crops. And we were talking about AI, and is, is this going to be mm. the next one? So why, why do you think, I mean, do you really think people understand science? Um, I, so MMR, we were talking about this before, but it's a bit of an outlier because I, weirdly I was at the press conference as a sort of drone reporter. And, um, and if um, really convincing scientists stand up on stage, a group of them, and say, you know, vaccines cause um, autism, then you've got a pretty bold 26-year-old reporter to go back and think, hmm, <laughs> I wonder if he's the outlier. And for, you know, the whole press reported faithfully, I'm sure Fiona Fox has been delighted with us mm. all. It, it, her name is Fiona Fox. Yes. We all did, as we were told, and we all reported accurately what was said on NMR, and that all that all ended really badly, obviously. I think that it's most, for example, if you look at health journalism, which I did years of, as all these trials come in, it's it just the same message beat, beating everyone on the head, you know, you know, a million people studied Mediterranean diet as best, and I think that people have read all of those things and those things start to add up into you know into something that's really credible and then if they read something else which is that a trial of six people found that eating alarm clocks cures cancer i think most people now would be suspicious mm. about that mm. so i think that's uh, interesting i think they're, they're interesting i think in terms of um health information we have access to more health information than ever before and for the most part, it's very uh, reliable, you know, it's well validated. Um, but the practice of medicine is increasingly complicated. And I think the complexity is keeping pace with the rise in information, such that I understand that in a previous seminar, you talked about the breast cancer, the government breast cancer screening scare story, in inverted commas. Uh, and I think that's an example of where the complexity of, you know, the genuine complexity of the issue is getting in the way of people you know, most of us really understanding what's going on there. And we're, that's where we need specialist journalists to really help us understand that. I'm being asked to switch microphones. Is that better? Hopefully. Um, so, uh, so I think that's true. I think there are... Is, is it on? Can you hear me at the back? Yes. Yeah. Cool. I've had a thumbs up on the back, so let me know if, it, if that changes. Um, 
Uh, what was I going to say? I was going to say that... journalists. Yes, I think they have an important role because I think um, there are uh, surveys of trust in uh, scientists, in public officials, in hairdressers, in estate agents, you know. And what we see is that trust in scientists is going down slightly, but much more slowly than trust in almost everybody else is going down. <laughs> So I think that's probably a facet of a kind of uh, a societal shift in deference to authority and institutions, which is maybe not a bad thing, actually, uh, that we hold our institutions to account, that we ask more questions, that we are a bit more sceptical about these kind of claims made on the basis of, I'm the expert and I'll tell you what to do. I think that's probably a very healthy situation. Um, so on the whole, scientists are very trusted, to tell the truth. Uh, the most trusted professionals are nurses, apparently, mm -hmm. uh, because I think they combine, they're seen to combine their expertise with that kind of human, you share my values, you know what it's like to be in this position kind of thing. And that's perhaps where scientists are less trusted. I think sometimes that the trust that we have in scientists as a public is potentially quite brittle. We trust them when they're in their labs doing their thing, you know, working away. But when it comes to should we accept this new technology into our society, this technology which might steal our jobs or poison our children or something very kind of scaremongery, um, if we think that scientists aren't like the rest of us, can we trust them to take the decisions that we would want them to take? Probably not. And that's why I think uh, feeling that science is part of our culture, feeling that it's part of our everyday lives for all of us or most of us is so important. I mean, I, I, what, I think what's very interesting is, is, is that in a way we've, we've got sort of two trends happening here. On the one hand, we're saying we've got a much more educated public, much more educated than parents and grandparents, and, and they really sort of seem to understand science. And there's been this burgeoning of science communication. Mm. But on the other hand, what we're seeing is just general mistrust of elites. And now it's very clear that the scientists and people who work in culture and the arts have been dragged into this concept. So we're, we're, we're also sort of have these two themes that are sort of passing each other. And, and maybe we just can't also generalize. I mean, we have a very diverse population. Um, we here in Britain, and I dare say the word Brexit, but I think that has really sort of thrown up that there are many different levels within our society. Um, and, and, and is it that you know, some people maybe get it more, but other people either don't get it or don't want to get it or are not interested in getting it? And, and how do how does someone like the British Science Association actually tackle that? So I think there's an assumption in that position, which is uh, about the scientists know better, which on a very specific technical question is probably true. But why would scientists know better than society at large about what's best for the society longer term? Scientists and specialists in general are very, very good, of course, at dealing with questions that focus on their specialism. But when it comes to what's the right way to introduce AI to protect our future livelihoods, an individual programmer is not going to be any necessarily any better position to deal with the, the breadth of that question than any of the rest of us in this room. It needs a collection of people to come together. The thing is, AI is already out there happening all around us. Algorithms are controlling everything every day. And that has happened without the way before the conversation mm. that we will in the end have. But on, um, on specialist journalists, with the exception of some organizations, people are all staffed up now with specialists. They get that people love science, environment, and health stuff. And um, the places are washed with fantastic specialists who not only hold press officers to account, but also hold the scientists to account. Say, are you really, is this really a world first, you know? But um, on things like GM, because of what happened, the kind of culture war, how toxic GM was and how effectively, was it bungled, wasn't it bungled, whatever. Um, I've covered a story this week, and I, and I only mention it because you raised it, is about how there's a whole load of GM food coming now, loads of it and you're going to eat it, and you're not being told about it, and the re it's better for you, the science is in, but um, the manufacturers just don't want to get into it, so they want you to start eating food cooked in oil that's much better, doesn't have trans fats in it, but they don't want you to know it has GM, and, and that's where we've sort of got to. It will be us eating stuff we might not choose to eat, um, and this is the world we've ended up in because of it becoming a culture war. And Health by stealth. Uh, and and so, so new scientists now mm. engages in these moral, ethical, 
cultural debates well, or this just... Isn't a debate. This is a report on the, the new wave of genetically modified foods and what they are and the fact... But we did, you know, ring up the people who made them and ask, you know, would they like to trumpet the amazing health benefits of this food? And they did not want to trumpet the, anything about the foods at all. They'd just rather... Because in, in America, the labelling's all different. It's much easier. Here in Europe, um, they have to rely on loopholes to sort of get this stuff into the food chain. But it, will, it is already in and will be more in. But how much would you report that? How much would you report the discussion around that this actually is a, you know, that, that there are some big moral and political and policy decisions to be made. W would, would you have a, yeah. a feature on that? Is, that's what that's, the feature is, yes. So, so, so that's exactly the kind of thing you were talking about? Yeah. Changing culture and... Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think it helps, it helps no one if people on one side of a particular debate or uh, working within the industry feel unable to speak up, you know? The, um, which, and I absolutely, if I was working on GM Foods in a lab today, or if I was running a company that did that, I wouldn't speak to New Scientist or anyone else either, mm. because I, it would just attract a kind of firestorm mm. um, that I could well do without. Uh, but is it right that we don't have the conversation as a society? I, d I don't think it is. Um, I think that uh, for policymakers to take informed decisions on our collective behalf, we need to be having the conversation in the public arena about well, you know, what kind of science and technology we want for the future. Um, and if only some of us are in the conversation, if only the specialists and the policymakers are in the conversation, then it, there's going to be a backlash. There's a risk of another backlash. Mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons I think AI is a particularly interesting debate area is because it shares, to my mind, some of the features of the original GM, GMOs debate 20 years ago. For example, a lot of research occurring in fairly small uh, corporate uh, business organizations, for-profit organizations, uh, and the kind of for-profit motive uh, makes a difference to the public. And the, the size of the organization, if you're only a small organization, you can't afford to be having members of your research team going out doing public engagement activities all the time. So that makes a difference. Um, I kind of sense that uh, if we get it wrong, the outcomes might be unnatural or go against nature in some way. Um, and a kind of mismatch of values. So part of, what, uh, part of what drove the original debate was a kind of sense that the people leading the research didn't share the values of the rest of us, that they were driven more by profitability values rather than kind of nutritional values, say. Um, and I think there's a risk that with AI that happens again. So the work that specialist journalists and general journalists do actually on unpicking all of those things is vital. One, one of the things that Fiona talked about last week was about the Animal Rights Brigade and how many, many scientists became very worried yeah. about being involved in that. But actually, it wasn't the scientists being attacked. Um, and, and so there were some targets, but individual scientists yeah. typically weren't attacked. So in the world of social media, obviously, it's far more... The scientists become more vulnerable if they are out there taking part in the public debate. Mm. Um, but right now, how must it feel to be a climate scientist? They must be the most worried, nervous people on the planet. And anything they say could just turn into this, not an adversary, something storm, uh, mm. and turn into a, you know, a, sto a toxic storm. And whenever science gets becomes in the middle of a, a culture war, whatever it's about, whether it's about climate or gender or what what are the what are all these big things that become really top vaccines again you're not allowed ever to breathe any word of criticism of any vaccine or it puts you in a corner over there with people with kids with measles so mm. yeah or with gm you're not allowed you you're not allowed to say well actually i am worried about kind of herbicides because that again puts you in a camp over there with people you know so i mean that a very good sort of opening um, to the audience, because sure, I know we do have some climate scientists in the room, oh. but, but let's open it up um, to um, questions or ideas. And, and we immediately have one over there. Um, and, and if you just put your hands up, then we can um, identify where the mic should go. Hello, thank you very much for this. Um, I just wondered for both of you, talking about will AI go the way of GMOs and things like that, and you mentioned that obviously researchers and those in business are busy trying to innovate and everything. So what would your sort of best advice be for what researchers and others can do to not go the way of GMOs? 
I think to get ahead of it, to go to, to, to not only say you might set up an ethics board, say, but to actually set up an ethics board and to to, to, to really be ahead of whatever the public will be thinking about and, and, and putting those checks and balances in now rather than just taking advantage of the fact that actually you can get away with a lot in tech before anyone realises. That would be my advice. Yeah, similar. I think um, uh, it can be hard for all of us to lift our heads up from the day jobs and think kind of big picture, long term, you know, what's my kind of wider social responsibility on this? And I think that um, the organisations that employ researchers have a responsibility to help those researchers do that. So that might be around training on public engagement skills. It might be around allowing them time away from the, the lab bench, however difficult that might be short term to help build a kind of a wider public support for these new technologies. Um, and for individual researchers, I think often uh, we might feel that, um, you know, well, what good does it do if I do a talk at a kind of amazing science festival on a Saturday morning, or, you know, if I kind of uh, write a blog for The Guardian, or, you know, these individual pieces, but collectively it makes a huge difference. And I think researchers should not only talk about their research, but also about themselves. It really helps us to see researchers as rounded people with the same worries and concerns mm -hmm. as the rest of us. Um, and as, you know, training to be a researcher trains us not to talk about ourselves and our families and our hobbies and, you know, all the rest of it. Um, but in a public domain, uh, it's really important that we see them as kind of human beings and part of our society. And, you know. You're sort of answering a different, well, you're asking the question of how can you come across well to the public. But what I was saying was if you're in a lab and you're, you know, you might accidentally build Skynet, you may be too young to know what that is, but then, you know, take seriously what you're doing. If you're doing something that could transform all of history, then are you doing absolutely everything you possibly can to think through the consequences of your actions? And if later you're asked to talk about it to the press or to anyone else, you'll have a lot to say about how seriously you took it. We have a lady here and then the lady over there. In the light of the fact that America has just elected a president who doesn't believe in climate change, uh, and you say, um, you said that uh, the public is becoming more knowledgeable about science. A, how do you explain that? And B, what can we do about the education of our children and adults in the future to ensure that uh, leaders are not elected on a counter science platform? Um. I just had, I met, um, and unfortunately her name's gone out of my head, but anyway, she's like the CEO of the Gates Foundation, and she was running a really interesting scheme in America, which was, <coughs> it was going into schools and teaching the kids about how fake news is propagated, and showing them that the sort of the flags that come up, the industry, or say, how the tobacco industry managed to keep it going for so long. And then once you've shown kids in some sort of civics class, um, Ha, 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 how fake news propagates, or the mechanisms with which industry keeps stuff going long after science has proved something else. Um, they found that those kids from all backgrounds came out really questioning stuff. And so that's just one very positive thing that I've heard that's in action in America. But no one can explain Trump. I don't know what he thinks he understands, or what he knows, or what he believes. I, I, I don't think he has any idea what he believes. And, no, I, I, I can't answer the question of Trump or how to ban future Trumps. Yeah. Is anyone like him? I, I, I mean, I, if you've read Fire and Fury by Michael Wolf, I think that he, I'm not sure anyone is like him, or very rare that people would be like him. Very unusual person. Mm. But I take your point that he got in. <laughs> yeah. So people liked him enough, they may not, they feel he's similar enough to have voted for him. Uh, and like all good charities, we are politically completely neutral, obviously. Uh, and, um, and I think it's a hard time to be a researcher in America, a publicly funded researcher in America now. Uh, and they are having to kind of save data to, you know, to try and ensure it's not lost. And these, it's a really uh, interesting time in history, I think, on that. In terms of the next generation, I think there are two competing ideas about what science is that kind of struggle for dominance in the school curriculum. One is that science is a body of facts, and if you want to know a fact, you ask a scientist. And if you're good at science, you learn all the facts. And the facts are known, you know, chemistry is finished, we know it all, it's a bunch of facts. Um, sorry to pick on chemistry. Uh, and the other idea is that it's a method. 
Scientific inquiry is a method you can apply to any question. And as we learn more and apply that method to more questions, we will change what is known about the universe. The universe itself will change uh, as we apply that method more and more. And those two ideas really kind of clash, I think, in the current UK curriculum. Uh, and I think, the, I think scientific inquiry as a method being the definition of science, I think that should win out. Just say one more thing about Trump. I saw a really good pie chart after all the results were in, and fewer than half of people in America voted either way. Uh, more than half either didn't <coughs> vote or weren't eligible. Of the just under half who did vote for someone, you know, these tiny triangle voted, you know, they were about that and then some extra. So uh, whatever it was, it was a really small number of people, relatively speaking, did vote for him. So that's about, you know, inequality, however much history had gone in before, all kinds of factors. And what he did or didn't say about science, I think, wasn't really, I, I don't know, but how many people voted for him because he didn't believe in climate change or was inarticulate about or made no sense about science. I would say that was a small number. And this is about sort of huge, <coughs> huge societal factors came into Trump. But it's still only a tiny number of people in America actually voted for him. Mm -hmm. So I feel if we could get some of the people on the bit of that pie chart who didn't vote or couldn't vote into the picture, then things would feel more positive. What, what about Google and the internet? I mean, is there a role for either of you in the new world where anyone actually can just go onto their computer and find out the facts about whatever they want to find out? Um, are you talking about Cambridge Analytica and no, the I'm impacts on the <coughs> ban and the impact on... No, I'm just having a Theresa May moment. Terribly yeah. sorry. <coughs> <coughs> I, I know. But so, so what I'm thinking about is, is, is that nowadays we Google everything. Yeah. Um, you know, and okay, if, if we've got time, we can, you know, go on and, and read new scientists in detail. But actually, for most people, there's a whole load of information out there. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, do we have knowledge or just lots of information? Do we really understand what's out there? And, and you know, why, why would people bother subscribing to you when actually, if I want to find out about anything, yeah. I can just Google it? Or, in fact, to you. Yeah. I mean, you know, I can, I can watch a YouTube video just mm -hmm. as much as go and sit with other scientists or other... So I think we need uh, reliable intermediaries more than ever before, and we have them. I think um, when I was talking earlier about those trust surveys, trust in journalists has gone up for the first time in a long time in the most recent Edelman Barometer survey at the end of last year. Um, and yeah, but up from... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not, not quite estate agent levels, but, you know, not scientists and nurse levels either. But it's gone up mm -hmm. in the sense that I think there's a greater recognition of the role that good journalists do in seeking out information, you know, double-checking sources, you know, not just kind of taking what's been fed to them and reproducing it or not just making stuff up. Although it comes back to what we talked about at the beginning, mm. which is, and in fact... Last year, there was an article by the new editor of The Guardian. Catherine Vinan. Catherine Vinan, um, where she talked about the fact that there's an increasing new cohort of younger journalists coming in, and they do not see their view to find the truth. They see their view to report. Uh, and actually quoted from um, some young journalists who were talking about, well, I, you know, whether this is fact or evidence, or whether it is hearsay or opinion, I will put it out there, and then it's actually up to the public to use their own nonce to find out what is this? Is it true or not? She wasn't talking about Guardian reporters, to be clear. Yeah. No, she wasn't yeah. talking about yeah. Guardian reporters. Yeah. And in actual fact, mm -hmm. to be honest, the, 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 the story that she started this whole um, idea around was the David Cameron story with the large pig head. And if you don't know about it, then Google David Cameron. Don't, don't, pig don't, don't, don't. <laughs> so, um, and, but, but then out of that, she then went on to say, how widespread is this, and started interviewing and talking to people. So, I mean, you know, presumably there, there must be lots of, of, of journalists who, are, who mm. latch on to something because it's newsworthy. And one of the things yeah. Fiona was talking about was about, um, you know, how do we get science into the news? It's a 24-hour business mm. now, so in the old days you would have a journalist and, and they would spend, you know, a whole day writing something. Now they've got to do four stories in a day, maybe. Maybe some, so, yeah. But but but, but sort of specialists, whether they're in broadcasters or broadsheets or the, the you know all, all the reasonable um, news outlets, they 
they're snooty about the press releases they're sent by scientists and they pick and choose and they think that that's not a good study or this is a good study and they make they think it's part of their job to make that call mm -hmm. and they'll ring up probably not the researchers but they'll ring up whoever mediated between the mm -hmm. science team and them and say you've got all your stats wrong the press release makes no sense you're wrong to say this is a first and at um, New Scientists, my new colleagues take that super seriously, where they're like, hmm, well, we'll be the judge of that. And they really pride themselves on knowing about the different teams, doing different bits of work around the world, so that they can give some idea to the audience about the relative importance of the work. And they see, they very much see that as part of their role, that not to get, of course, nobody's perfect, but not to get breathless about one thing without really knowing who else is doing what in the world and what's come before. So. That's definitely how they see their role to to mediate and to have a lot of sort of archival knowledge about what's going on and where. Mm. Mm. We run um, uh, a scheme called Media Fellows, Media Fellowships, which places active researchers in media organisations for a month, and it's fascinating what they say about each other at the beginning of the placement and then what they say about each other at the end. So um, there's a there's a kind of, it's common, I think, for researchers to feel that the media overhypes, you know, findings, doesn't really understand the complexity of stuff and is a bit impatient, you know, and kind of not specialist uh, media mm -hmm. so much, but I think general daily news media. Um, and I think from the media's point of view, it is difficult to get researchers to comment on the issues that they want them to comment on rather than researchers then work. Perhaps they take a long time to get back to them. You know, there's just a kind of, difference in working cultures really and so by placing the scientists in the media organization they get to see into each other's workplace cultures which is really interesting um, and the researchers come away from the placement feeling uh, that they they really understand why the media behaves like the media behaves and that they are much better placed to help get science stories into the media it's quite funny like how often it happens that there'll be an enormous story in nature and uh, the main scientist will be unavailable because they hadn't foreseen that on the day that that came out, all the press releases went out, that that would be the exact day people want to talk to them, or the day before. <laughs> but a week later was of no value to any daily... Uh... Sorry, I, I and, and I also have to say that definitely over the last decade, the accuracy of reporting the research in the area that I work in has gone up tremendously. You know, I mean, 10 years ago, well, you know, you would you would be rung up for something and then it would be completely misinterpreted in the press and that happens far less now yeah. actually so it's, not, it's so, not a perfect no. picture and there will be times the journalist doesn't have time to ring someone who wasn't involved in the mm -hmm. science and you do all end up doing a bad job because you took the press release or one person's word mm -hmm. for it but i do think overall it's getting better mm -hmm. okay you've been very patient waiting to talk Hi, um, I'm Leslie Patterson. I'm Head of Public Engagement with Research here at the University of Oxford. And GM is quite often portrayed as a failure. But in the interest of being a devil's advocate, I would like to claim it's the greatest public engagement success the UK has ever seen. We asked society what they thought and the wider public, and they said, we don't fancy it. They're not anti-science, but we don't fancy these applications. We don't fancy Monsanto selling sterile seeds to African farmers so they can never produce their own seeds again big business, GM being part of our food. And also I was involved in lots of public dialogues with synthetic biology, which is GM, you know, squared, it's mm. GM excess. And people were very supportive of synthetic biology. Those people, the same people that were against GM were very supportive of synthetic biology because the applications were very different. It was biofuels, it was creating uh, drugs, antimesitin um, for antimirelial drugs. All it was all contained and people were very accepting. So, GM, UK's greatest public engagement success ever. Discuss. That was really interesting. I don't think I've disagreed with uh, something so much for weeks, Leslie. So, it's um, good to be having this conversation. Uh, and, um, uh, and this is what a panel debate is for, right? No, the I juicy... like it. I like it. I've never thought about it that way. Uh, the reason I think it was a, a meltdown, GMO's debate, was the timing. So, I'm not trying to say that the public should have made a different decision. But I think to have a backlash against the technology that has already been introduced into the market after all of the investment has been made in the research and the applied research and the commercialization of it, that's a complete waste of resource. 
That's why I think it was a meltdown. And it kind of polluted a lot of related debates that weren't really about GMOs or about something completely different. And it generated huge suspicion between public and researchers that kind of the waves of which, you know, reverberated for years. So I don't think, I don't say that I think it was a uh, not public engagement's greatest success because of the, the outcome, because the public rejected GMOs. I think the public is entirely uh, right to reject any technology. You know, that's, that's, that's democracy, you know, working. Um, but I think to have that uh, conversation at that point after which the tomato paste was on the shelves in the supermarkets, that was the bit that was a long way from being ideal. The thing that I would highlight as being a great success of public engagement with science are the conversations we've had around reproductive technologies. So licensing of the various kind of IVF methods and the, license, the regulatory uh, approval for mitochondrial donation, I think they are public engagement successes. They're really tough questions. They carry this sense of, are we being unnatural? You know, who benefits? How do we, you know, we're playing, literally playing with people's lives. You know, how do we, mm. what, what decision should we make about this? But on the upside, you know, there are children dying of terrible uh, you know, diseases, from mitochondrial disease, blah, blah, blah. Mm. So the way to have that conversation, as the regulator for that industry has recognised, is to have a, 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 a kind of long and deliberative ongoing conversation for years before the decision, the regulatory decision, needs to be made. And the Human Fertilisation Embryo Embryology Authority, I think, have done a really good job of kind of, of stewarding that conversation and saying, it, you know, the public might say yes or no to any particular question, but we're going to um, have the conversation very carefully so that when the, before the technology is ready, so that when the technology is ready, we, you know, or potentially ready, we know what the, what the public opinion would be. Was the tomato based on the shelves? Because I remember sort of as from a journalist point of view, we were like, where are they going to grow it? There's going to be a test field somewhere. Can we get a reporter there? So I think it, it did he get to paste on shelves? Did it? Oh, okay. Um, I know I really think that's really interesting what you said. I never thought about it that way around. I mean, it didn't, in America, it's all GM everything, isn't it? And it's GM all around the world, and it's us and bits of Europe that are an outlier. That's very interesting. Def definitely the, um, the government sees it as one of their biggest public communication mistakes. And, and when, when, when you sort of said you thought it was a success, um, the reason why I think it retrospectively was a success, it was that definitely the Government Office of Science woke up and said, we've got to do something completely different. And that then led to a decade of really trying to get their act together. And, and they say GM was when it happened because it just took it for granted that they would say, oh, hello, hang on, we're going to do this. And the public went, no, you're not. And it was a real sort of shock um, when that happened. So, uh, OK. Other, yes, Maya. <coughs> Thanks. Um, I'm going to follow on on this whole backlash thing. Um, you just reminded me of something that, Catherine, you said at the start uh, when you were describing the four groups um, and their relations to science. You basically made it seem that it was the three quarters of the people who are not science that um, not communicating with them about it was the reason for this backlash. And I would maybe suggest that um, a lot of the people who were anti-GMO and also anti-vaccine and anti um, global warming would not consider themselves anti-science at all, um, at least according to your surveys, they would probably tick the other boxes. They use the language of science. There's something called the, um, the Dunning-Kruger effect, which I think might be quite important. And so, yeah, I don't know. What's your comment on, like, this might be a dangerous thing to disregard the people that consider themselves science and focus on, on the others? They're very different groups, those three groups, aren't they? I don't know if there's any overlap between those three. It'd be interesting. Sorry, Karen. It would be really interesting. I think you're right, of course, that humans are far more complex um, and we can't divide UK society neatly into these four groups. I think it's true to say that uh, if, if, uh, if you were thinking about like which category you might be in, you might put yourself in a different group thinking about like physics and astronomy compared to health and medicine or nutrition or, you know, we are of course more complex than that. Um, but I think it's a fair point to say that uh, people don't, very few people reject the whole establishment of science, you know, the kind of, uh, uh, and the groups that, re that uh, oppose or campaign against particular uh, technologies wouldn't necessarily describe themselves as kind of anti, we're not anti-science, we're not anti-establishment, it's, it's, this thing is wrong. 
Um, for us, in our, the way that we categorize people, we categorize them by the strength of their connection to science, not how positive they are about science. So people who are campaigning against a particular technology by engaging with the evidence, you know, by kind of publishing blogs and quoting studies and, you know, kind of getting stuck into the debate, for us would be in the engaged category because they are actively engaged. They're talking to researchers or they're trying to talk to researchers or whatever. Um, it's the people who are just ignoring the whole thing and, like, you know, going about their daily lives that are a particular, a particular interest to us as a target audience for our programmes and activities. Does that respond to the point you're making, or...? I think it might be dangerous to leave out the people who are engaged but are terribly, terribly wrong, <laughs> even though they're convinced they're right and are convinced they're doing it in the scientific way and they're using the language of science and they're quoting, you know, they're, they're quoting academic, sorry, journals, even though they've been discredited. But, you know, they're still, I think they're the dangerous ones because, well, I think they might be some of the more dangerous ones um, because they have the conviction. Um, uh, and you might be right about the, the, the danger levels. Um, I suppose we see our role in this wider picture, and there are lots of kind of groups and networks and, you know, who are trying to uh, communicate with those groups to, uh, I don't know, to change the way, to change their perspective or to offer alternative evidence, whatever. That's not something we do as a charity, so uh, we are interested in building science as part of culture for the groups who aren't engaging. Um, but that's not to say that activity is not worthwhile, it's just not our thing. I think there's a very different group. So the people who care about vaccines, um, the whole, you know, the whole of the medical establishment has come down smash against them, um, smash. And the people who don't engage with climate science are such disparate groups. You know, you get columnists in the Times of London, you get, you know, like really sort of disparate groups and you can't, um, oh God, his name always escapes me, but um, Matt Ridley, is it? And he, mm -hmm. well, anyway, you could put them down on the more denying side of things as well as Trump and as well as whatever, old, you know, old groups you get around the place. And then the, the GM people are now the triumphant, um, are, 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 you know, the triumphant bearers of great science gone. So they're very different, all those different people you're talking about, aren't they? So what is the, the next GM? And given that in theory we're a more educated, more sophisticated society, and we have groups like you trying to get it within, embed it within the culture, and, and if you like, our sort of daily living, how, how will society react? What's the next big thing? So I think the next big controversy will be around AI, uh, or big data, or where those two things kind of interface. Uh, because nobody quite knows what it is in terms of, oh, well, we know what it is. <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a bit harsh. Um, uh, we can't, it's very difficult to predict how it will affect our daily lives as individuals, as citizens. That's the bit that's hard. And it was similar, I think, for Jim. The thing that, if you'd asked us, if we'd been having this conversation 10 years ago, uh, I think we'd have all said nuclear power. And yet, no, that, that hasn't been a kind of, source of massive public debate and outcry. Uh, locally, yes, but nationally, no. Mm. Emily? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, th the thing with AI is it's really hard to report on well because, um, it, you know, the sort of the kind of the big things that are happening are in the hands of these massive, very powerful companies that they've got no reason to let journalists in, so they don't. And so then you're dependent on whistleblowers. And, you know, that's a really hard way to... That's really a hard way to monitor something that could change all of our lives and is already changing all of our lives. Very, very interesting. So when, um, because the industrial strategy obviously is, is being sort of rolled out and, and yesterday there, there was a government debate um, because the Prime Minister had made this speech on Monday about AI and health and how chronic diseases are going to be conquered because we're going to be able to use AI and, you know, algorithms are now going to detect cancer rather than doctors, etc. Um, and the really interesting debate that came up from the audience was exactly that. Um, what about a public backlash against using a computer to detect breast cancer? So already, if, if you like, um, people are beginning to sort of start talking about it in that way. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a different, you know, all, all, all technology glitches and bugs. And so in a hospital or, or any setting where you're just looking at, you know, for whether you're flying an aircraft or whatever, if you just listen to the technology on an absolutely crucial life or death decision and you have no other way to check it if the screen isn't working, you're going to get problems. The, the thing with AR is that, and I know everyone in AI hates people making jokes about Skynet and they hate all that, but that, that <laughs> but then other people in AI talk about, you know, the, the general consciousness or whatever, so um, general intelligence or whatever by 2029. So it's a place where everything that's happening is outstripping not only journalism but government mm. and it's a really interesting area. And, and I would say an, an area that is definitely coming into longevity research is, you know, transhumanism. Transhumans, mm. when, mm. when, you know, we will actually have body parts that are... Cyborgs. Cyborgs, mm. yes, yes. Um, and, and that definitely is... is the potential reality of, of the way that science is going. Um, and there must be a huge debate just around the corner on that. We, we have a question at the back. Um. Um, so thinking about accessibility of what journalists write, and obviously we, the researchers issue um, papers and you know, to help you when they've got new research coming out. When I was at university, I did a science subject. And at my university, we had to do a sort of course called um, art science to try and teach us as scientists to not write everything in a science way. So my question is, if we're being taught from an early age about writing science way or in an arts and humanities way, should we actually all be taught how to write any subject that's to make it more accessible to anybody's background? This is the science art debate. Oh. Um, I, 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 I'm trying to think back to, was I taught to write in any particular way at school? Um, I, you know, it was sort of a dream world. Anyone who really understands something should be able to explain it to anyone else. Um, but we don't live in that dream world. And often the very cleverest people and the most brilliant scientists aren't brilliant at communicating their own work. Um, that's where mediators come in. Um, I, I think there are definitely better ways of teaching, there must be better ways of teaching science at school and university, so that, um, and, and that are less straight-jacketed. In my second year at university, I was allowed to do two-thirds chemistry, shoot me now, uh, I, I personally found it um, quite a, a dry degree, and then a third, ancient history, where I had to cycle across town, and it was a thing and I was like oh my god I get to like write essays about Greece and get credits ha ha um, but, but the, the, I think the more people are allowed to sort of break out their disciplines a bit I think the sort of healthier it is so, so the, um, the last in this series we're going to have the museums we've, we've got the science museum the natural um, history museum from Oxford and the Ashmolean mm -hmm. and when we wrote to the director of the Ashmolean and I'm sure he won't mind me saying this, he came back immediately and said, I think you've got the wrong museum with the Ashmolean. I think you want the Natural History Museum. And we went back and said, no, actually, we exactly want arts and archaeology to be part of this debate because of culture and science. And then he was very, very positive and is going to come. But his immediate reaction was, well, what am I doing in a, a, a sort of science conversation? Um, we have a lot of questions, so we're going to be very quick because we're beginning to run out of time. Can we have a sort of a quick question here and then a question there and the lady who's also been waiting? So that's three more questions and then we're going to have to stop, sadly. So if we can make our questions quite short. Well, yes, I'll try and make it as short as possible, which means I can give hardly any information, which is information you will never have heard of. And that's what I want to ask you or comment. Um, there is a United Nations treaty to abolish nuclear weapons. This came on stream last September, uh, and it trundled along, and it got to the point where it could go open for signatures, and 122 nations signed. Subsequently, 58 nations have signed up to ratify it. We have heard nothing from the media whatsoever. Has anybody heard about it? You may have heard about the... Nobel Peace Prize. That was on, that was broadcast about, and that was the woman who won it with the uh, Hiroshima survivor, 
Um, she is the chief executive of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. And she's actually nursed this concern through the world, through a number of uh, meetings and so on. Why did we not hear anything? Because if the public cannot hear about this, they cannot form any opinion. Thank you. Um, it's not clear our, our, um, our panel here can answer no, I that. No, I agree. But, you know, but these organisations you know, are, you know, they, they, we get really excited about one thing and mm. things that are really important mm -hmm. don't get the coverage they should. And, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we, we have I was a... criticising the news. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, bringing back to where you began, I think, and, and about embedding science into our culture, which I think is a lovely idea. And I, I can't help thinking whether or not, in that respect, science is one of its own worst enemies. Um, scientists themselves, of course, are, are fully aware of the fact that the results that they are coming up with, they are not the final word that will be said. This is not the truth. Uh, and, and therefore, when later uh, a, a colleague comes up with something, they say, actually, that wasn't quite right. We've now found out something else. That, that is that pursuit of knowledge and adding to that body of knowledge, which, which is what science is all about. But of course, when that is being communicated, it does nothing but confuse. I mean, I'm sure everyone in this room, you know, we were told that we'd go to work on an egg, and then we were told we shouldn't eat an egg, and now we should be eating two or three, I think. Yeah, I, I think they're okay know. again, yeah. Um, and, and, yeah. And it's all science. And unless someone is able to turn this into uh, uh, the culture, it becomes part of the culture, then, then we're, we are, I think, probably in a way our worst enemies. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, egg confusion uh, is, uh, happens for all sorts of topics, you know, even something saintly like broccoli, you know, it gets a bad rep sometimes, so it is really hard. Um, and of course, when it comes to health and nutrition, and to a lesser extent the environment, people are making daily decisions about, you know, whatever these topics are. Um, I think one of the, I think there's two issues that that drive that. One is the um, this tendency for researchers, scientists, to present science as a body of facts. You know, we feel the need, maybe as researchers, to be authoritative about what we know. Because when we know it, we really know it. Mm. But, you know, tomorrow... Like vaccines. Definite. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then that backfires when next year there's a new study that says don't eat bacon or whatever it is. Right? Uh, so, if we could get better at presenting science as a process of inquiries, uh, that I think would help us with that kind of, actually we know something different now, and it looks less like we're just sold out our colleagues or whatever, and more like this is normal science, you know, science at work. Um, I think, uh, um, uh, and I've completely forgotten the second point I was going to make, so maybe we'll do that later. <laughs> okay, um, and just a final question. Uh, to what extent do you think having science figureheads, people like Brian Cox and David Attenborough, um, maybe help science become part of culture, or perhaps hinder the view of scientists as one of us? Oh, David Attenborough. I'm like, he is one of us. <laughs> That's why everybody loves him. Um, and Brian Cox, I don't know if he's one of us, but um, <laughs> whenever I'm watching his shows, I'm like, wow, in this moment, I understand what he's saying. And then afterwards, it was like a dream. But I don't think he does any harm, does he? <laughs> it's not think. great praise. Brian Cox probably harmless. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a great question. Yes. Yeah. Because I think that, of course, Brian Cox is harmless. And, um, and he's actually, I have a great deal of respect for somebody who can be such a expert storyteller as to make people think the kinds of the bits of physics that he talks about are really fascinating like that is some skill um i really admire him and i think he um uh, he tells a great story when he was launching his last uh series onto the bbc he's like they have a rule on bbc one about no equations right and he's like but my new series is going to be a few equations They're like nope no equations on BBC One. And he talked to them around, and that's the first time there have been equations on primetime TV on BBC One for a long time. So, uh, so he, can, he can open doors that others can't. You know, he does us all a great favour. Well, what I think is challenging, though, is that we have so few science role models that people like Brian Cox start to look like that's what science is, you know? If for members of the general public who don't, who don't feel that they know any scientists or don't work in science themselves. And every time they think of science, they picture Brian Cox and somebody in a lab coat or um, 
One of the most pervasive images of scientists, actually, is Einstein. When you get kids to draw a picture of a scientist, six, seven-year-old kids, they all draw a white male in, you know, 50s or 60s with really crazy hair. Dead white dude. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. What is that about? It's been a long time since Einstein was amongst us, so it is very pervasive. So I think uh, one of the things researchers can do is to develop, is to encourage a kind of broader range of role models of people who personify science and challenge the dead white dude kind of meme um, and challenge the idea that you have to be super brainy because some scientists are super brainy but some of them aren't and they are just as valuable to our future health and economy. So. That, that, that is a, a wonderful question to end on for various things. One, one it brings us back into that circle that, that in a way people sort of get David Attenborough and Brian Cox, but they still probably don't get the process, and, and that's the sort of next big challenge. The next thing is, actually, um, we've only had women. So everyone you have seen so far has been a scientist, and next week you've got another woman. So we, we actually are, are showcasing scientists and people who are connected with science who, who are different role models. And, and it wasn't done purposely. I just thought, who are the best people? And but we're You're both the first in our organisations, aren't we? We're both the first women in our own role. Mm. Yeah. Yes. So it's still early yes. doors. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and what we're going to move on to next week um, is... In, so Nikki Hawkins um, works for a private foundation whose job is to present science to the public um, in a way that actually they can then relate to and also to work with the scientific community and I hope she's going to bring some of her videos because some of the videos she does are, are just fantastic. Um, and again, it goes back to arts and culture and, and just using different types of media to make it sort of part of our lives. So can, can we thank our two panellists for... Thank you. for